Hi, Simon. Hey, Santis. It's very nice to interview you. And uh, my first question is, what is good musical composition for you? Yeah, for me, that's not really a question that can be answered, but I'm happy about, about the last part of the question, which was for you, because of course, to talk about good music almost doesn't make sense because it changes from person to person, changes from the definition of music, it changes from the definition of good, etc. But of course, I do understand the question. So uh, to, uh, to generalize, I would say for me, it's probably uh, an experience where I have the feeling that uh, the material and the idea is organized in an interesting way in time, right? But it's a super general way of saying it. And so um, uh, what I would also say is I can ma imagine or I'm sure that there are innumerable ways that a piece can be good on that I've never even thought about yet. Yeah, so um, that would be my super general answer. And of course, I could also answer in a different way by saying um, in my own work, I do my best too. And then, of course, I have some some criteria for myself that I'm really interested in, but it's not an exclusive yes. um, definition of what's good or bad. But what I try to and take care of is that there is um, some sort of feedback back and forth between the composition and the form and the material and the idea and the context so that everything is kind of well connected um, and so that's my strategy to to make something interesting is always to look for the right uh, realization of the idea and also the material which ideally makes the idea come first then maybe a sort of vague feeling about the material and then only then the choice of media and only then the organization in time which is what i would define as composing can you just give maybe uh, some uh, some example of of uh, of your pieces right so because you said it's about you right so right so let me illustrate uh, yeah. um Um, well, I can give one example of, um, I, I mean, I can give tons of, of examples. I'm just thinking what, what could be the meaningful way. Uh, but I have, I have pieces that are really just based on one tiny idea and they end up in the form of a study and it's mostly five minutes long piece. I'm very concerned with the with the with the disposition of the material, but it's 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 a super short form, and uh, and in a way the idea here is then dictating that form because one of the ideas is to focus on one piece of material, and I'm 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 kind of end the form kind of ends when I have the feeling this material is used up, you know? and then. If you take another piece, large scale, um, uh, my last work, which is a, uh, is a staged experience, so to speak, uh, there I had really a process where I did not fix anything in time before I had kind of a confirmation from the other elements. So was also used as an instrument. I did not compose for it before it was actually finished and I could see how it works. I could play around with it. And since there are also people moving around, there's a choreography on this stage. I couldn't really fix the choreography before the stage was finished, 
but I could also um, couldn't finish the stage before I tried out the choreography, showing what the limitations were for these people in exchange with the with the stage. So it's like a sort of way of solving a paradox puzzle that does that can't really have one place of beginning. So I'm trying to uh, get all these elements together, and then if I'm lucky suddenly it uh, it snaps and connects and ideally and the reason that i try to do this is because for me that's one way of ensuring that all these elements come together so not just the composition but everything else stage sound material choreography the players the individuality the personality of the players um the context which it's it is shown in the expectations that you might have for certain kinds of material, etc. Example, but um, that may answer your question. I don't know. So, and um, how would you describe your, let's say, musical signature? Right, this is your your perspective, right? But uh, but yeah. uh, the way how you make, let's say, or some yeah. elements how you uh, with whom you work in, right? In music. Um, I understand um, your question, and I think sometimes it's more difficult for um, oneself to describe it. But um, the other day I heard an interview where they were talking about my music, and they described it as um, somehow always optimistic. So that those are not my words, uh, but I would say maybe more general way more broad way than uh than to say optimistic i would say it's it's kind of uh, positive uh which doesn't necessarily mean optimistic it just means it's 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 aiming for something it's aiming for an intense uh, experience rather than avoiding something else and uh or at least if it had if it avoids something, it's always uh, with the purpose of getting somewhere else. Um, and so on one hand, I would say, I really try more and more to wait for the right idea and use a lot of time to develop that idea to be sure that that next project is something that has a strong identity and that kind of um, exists in the world independently from my other works and maybe other works by other people. So it has this strong identity uh, or personality. And so that part of the work almost pretty much feels like I'm erasing my signature and starting from scratch every time and really finding. But that is, of course, not true because I and other people can always uh, or also see all of the things that repeat from piece to piece, or uh, at, le at least and easily a sort of sort of attitude. Um, I said positive, but another way of saying it is also something informal. I like humor, but I don't uh, construct humor, I think, uh, but it's something that comes from this informality. And and uh, and a playful approach, uh, and of course the clash of expectations and turning things upside down. Yeah. Um, so you like surprise, right? Huh? You like surprising. You, you like to build surprising experiences. Absolutely. And so those elements could probably be summarized into some sort of signature, independent from the fact that sometimes it takes place in a different media with quite different material um, um, and that on a different level, these projects are really also quite different. And for my feeling, right, when I, when I feel, uh, when I'm watching your pieces, uh, I have a feeling that, uh, that you like a is very post-structuralist composer who likes to combine uh, sometimes or previously uncombinable, let's say, uh, no ideas together and explore how to combine uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and from these buildings this unique uh, surprising uh, experience yeah and i think you could 
um, um, combine or you could even generalize and say more and more I seem to just be um, fascinated by and for me it seems to be almost enough if I can find a way to to take something familiar yes and do something with it that makes us experience it in a different way or upside down or give it a twist and of course one of those would be to bring together two uh, individually familiar objects but in some sort of clash or in a way that they affect each other or at least the way we perceive them and so um, some sort of uh, yeah I think my my gradual transition has been from I mean a lot of people's I think most people are searching for a certain form for form of ambiguity you know, in a way to to have a sort of richness and depth uh, in the experience so that it's not just finished by by one listening and a lot of times earlier and i can see around me also a lot of composers are working or looking for ambiguity through let's say a sort of distortion of the elements or uh, unclarity you know? and i think i've just come to find uh, that I'm just more fascinated by, or that you can have this ambiguity much more concrete as a part of the experience, much more literal, much more in forefront, uh, by not using unclarity, but by combining incongruent uh, elements you know, that also don't get into one stable situation, that don't go up. Uh, in in a very uh, in a simple way that also raises questions or creates this instability or ambiguity or depth in the experience. Do you identify yourself as a multimedia composer? Uh, sure, but but you know um, that's for me. A, a media is also text and sound and so uh, for me of course i know by media you mean digital media or or performance or, or some, yeah 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 so uh, but i think the moment you put something on stage i mean if the audience don't close their eyes it's it's already multimedia no? yes, yes. of course that's kind of a, a way of turning your question around but uh, so when i think back i think since I always had this feeling that even if I went to a concert, the physicality, the, the situation, everything for me, I had to admit at some point, reluctantly in the beginning, that that was just a very important part of my experience. So I think for me, music has most of the time, I can remember back, been multimedia. No? And but also multi multimediality in itself uh, is maybe, I would stress, not something that I find interesting. No, I, I don't find something interesting just because it's multimedia. And I think in some time, in some, uh, in some, for some ideas and some materials, a certain combination of media can be just the just right. But in others, especially if there's not, doesn't seem to be a clear motivation, the addition of media can be can be a distraction or or something ideal thing that idea so i don't have some sort of um automatic fascination of combining these different medias yes. yeah. Uh, yeah. what i what i do have a fascination of is exploring two sides of the same thing and that's how often how i use the media to establish that some element actually uh, uh, belongs to these two different categories that I can play around with, either by having them side by side or by changing perspective, etc. No? And what is your process of composing? Uh, how you start or or mm -hmm. 
Well, I start more and more, or since a long time, I start with this that I described before, really with this vague idea that I keep developing. And I use a long time uh, like that before I even really start considering material. Um, but when I then come to the material and I start looking for material, that's also a very important stage. And then these two combined end up nowadays for me being a much bigger chunk of time and work than the actual, let's say, disposition in time of this material uh, and these uh, ideas. But not to say that it's less important, just to say that the more time I use here, the more I'm, I know the material and the idea and the, the faster I get to this one version of how it could actually play out in a good way but for me it's not a less important part of the work it's just been uh, interesting for me to see how maybe let's say it has shifted and a part of this is what i said before a way to make sure for myself that each piece is something special has a strong identity and so i even try not to commit to, to a commission or a task or a project before I really have the feeling this, I have now the idea that could guarantee that this will be a special project. So to answer your question like this, but again, it feels sort of different every time. So I have these different ideas and then at some point, some things in the situation comes uh, are connected or aligning and I start diving into it and actually I'm often diving into lots of different ideas and then at some point comes the time where I speed up and and not just I really emerge myself in this idea and um, yeah. it feels yeah I have the feeling the more experience I'm supposed to get the 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 um, yeah, it's not getting easier in a way. No, it's the in a way, the harder it seems, or the less I seem to be able to say this is how I compose. Because one would think that after a certain amount of time, there was a way to do it. Um, um, but at least when you stand in the middle of it, I always feel that I go into the water until it goes up to here and I and I navigate as good as I can but I also have to imagine things and take chances and um, and fight a little bit to uh, to to navigate and, uh, and once you told me that 50 percent of success to your mind is uh, is set up right so that you are very 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 like uh, I understand from you that you are make uh, this is very crucial and you are very very careful on that. Right? Mm -hmm. What kind of instruments were and etc. And I understand from your perspective, these decisions are you are not taken as a granted, right? You are very careful on selecting and pushing this decision as late as possible, right? Well, no, actually, as early as possible, so to speak, sure. but also as late as possible. Yes, in the sense that for me it has to be well. I, I don't know what I said, but I wouldn't use the word success maybe, but uh, let's just say that um, the way I work, the setup, which is also what I mean by the main idea, you know, or even the material, all these things kind of goes into the setup. The way I work, they seem to be in the end, almost more important than, than the, the timely organization, which Again, I stress is not that I, because for me, it's also essential that everything is timed and I'm very concerned with form, etc. And I love the detail and I love, so in a way I have these two sides yes. and I don't want to, I don't want to live with any of them, without any of them, no? Uh, and 
traditionally maybe you see them more as um, as opposites. Either you have a strong idea, uh, and then maybe the realization is not so important until the point where you have a concept which is really if I tell it to you or if you experience it, it doesn't necessarily make a big difference. I can always fully appreciate this as an idea. And so I guess what I like is that I can tell you about an idea and you can appreciate it. You can actually always already have something out of me yes. telling you about the setup or the idea. But once you go to the concert and you have a more physical, visceral, timely yes. experience, sensoric, uh, then of course, you see that the realization was also essential yes. to grab the whole thing of the piece. So I want the best of those two worlds, and yes. uh, I don't believe that they have to um, exclude each other. Yes, yes. And do you uh, often to speak uh, and probe your ideas before? Sorry. Um, do you usually do you often speak with people before and, and to check uh, a reaction, or or it's not your way? Um, so basically. I guess for everybody, if if you want to do something that takes some sort of organization, uh, or let's just say money, no? if you need a budget to realize your idea, you have to convince some people quite far or quite well ahead of time. You have to convince them that this is a great idea worth their time and their money and their platform, right? And so there, there are always a time where you have to tell people about it and you have to make people excited about it because if not, it's not, it's not gonna happen, no? Yes. I mean, uh, even in the cases, which is very often the case that I have to sort of carte blanche, there comes a time where things have to start connecting and they, start ha they need to have some sort of confirmation that this is happening and in what di which direction it's going so they can do their their part of the production so already in a quite early state i am um, i i have some sort of concept which of course is always formulated in a way so that it's open enough to to change um as as a dive further into it uh and yeah, and it always, it's it's actually a good and a bad turning point for a piece. No, it's good because you actually I need to get some stuff on paper. Yes. And sometimes that reflects back on the brain yes. um, in a good feedback. Yes. And, and then, of course, it's also bad because you kind of have to take some decisions that I would much rather maybe take later. Let's say very concretely, like how many, how many, um, how many people do you need to perform this piece or which instruments or etc. No? And so sometimes I would love to say, um, if it's not already a part of the idea that it has to be this specific, um, that it doesn't have to be people, but that this, uh, these, if the idea doesn't dictate a certain thing, then of course I'd ra much rather wait and see where it ends. Yeah. So yeah. I try to keep things as open as I can, as long as I can. And at the same time, I have to communicate quite clearly. This is this sort of project is going in that direction. Yes, 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 got it. And um, how your music changed in, let's say in the last 10 years? Mm -hmm. uh, In a certain way, I think it changed not by changing, going much further in some directions or ideas that were already present. No? So if I think, for example, in 2010, I made a piece called Overtures and it deals with concrete samples recognizable that has a sort of cultural meaning it's it deals with uh, gestures um, and micro um, theatricality this is a, this is a Chinese instrument and it's 
there's a box in the end and it's being opened and closed and that has an impact on on um, uh, on the music as well and so I guess those are more or less and then of course uh, uh, timing and uh, musical development uh, in the orchestra and uh, and quite an important form and disposition kind of uh, and I think those elements are those elements that I still work with, uh, just in different ways. And of course, sometimes much more explicitly and sometimes, um, yeah. So, so I, the bigger change was the 10 years before that, which was this slow realization of the power of the, of the changed concept, the context of the familiar element. No? Yes, yes. Starting maybe sort of in 2003 or four, 2004, I think, in a piece called Amit, where one of the starting ideas was actually to have in the middle of something non-tonal, having one little tonal harmony with the effect of making that little tonal element, which was one hundredth of the duration of the piece or maybe one maybe even less to make that the alien the idea was to make the familiar element the alien yes right so and back then that was the way i came up with to balance no to establish something on its own right and only when you kind of accept it okay this is a music in its own right you introduce the familiar element and it seems almost like a strange thing no yes i'm not sure if it worked in this way, but that was the idea. No? And so back then it was more a question of balance. No? And then only later I found ways of also not tipping the boat yes. so that it becomes a tonal music or that it becomes, to keep the, this feeling that it's, it's a quotation to, and to keep uh, it not taking over, to, to keep the music not tipping into something theatrical maybe. I, I realized slowly only that there are ways to integrate it and to work with these double situations. No, so if there's a, you know, and that, but exactly. And then that actually ended up in being quite conscious in that piece I just mentioned, Overtures in 2010, where I came up with, okay, I have this sound of a Chinese police car. Yes. And it, it means the same thing for these Chinese people that maybe police or ambulance would mean in for uh, uh, for people in, in Europe, and and I want to use it so they they get this image in their head. But I also want to use it in a way where it has a musical excuse, so that it perfectly belongs to both worlds. You both say that was the next logical step musically it doesn't come as a surprise it's just fitting right in there but also you have this arrow out of the concert hall um, um, and this concrete element that has some sort of of meaning no? so this way of integrating by by looking for thing for the musical side of things and really creating a structure and a layup so that when it comes it just fits perfectly musically but at the same time, of course, it still means something as well outside of the music. So I, I came to that point around, let's say, 2010. Also, the piece Double Up. So it goes very much into this direction. And then I just, from there, I just boosted in that direction. No? But, and went in very different ways, gestures uh, and sounds in, in black box music and uh, other pieces with video maybe let's say culminating in in my one of my later pieces trio as the same thing but go taking it in a, an extreme and in a large scale format with um, with uh, the combination of video and instruments etc no? uh, so i think big change but more in the sense of diving deeper into those elements uh, and staying fascinated by the same elements but just changing the way i approach it and on a certain level 
making the music or the experience clearer in order to have more space for exactly that. So kind of getting a lot of other stuff out to have more space for that kind of complexity. No? So getting simpler and simpler in, in, in maybe in the, in the time organization, getting also simpler in the, in the clarity of the elements and getting um, simpler in the reduction of the amount of material. Um, that's not always true, but as a general tendency, and then in the hope or also with the feeling that then there is a, I can have a bigger complexity in, in the, the work with the science and the meanings and the clashes, yeah, as well as in the form where I often work with these very sharp, quick cuts that I don't do in order to confuse people because I really have reduced everything else in order to get uh, a complexity that you can still follow. So that if you have a cut, you still have the feeling that you're cutting to a different scene that you can identify like in a movie and you're cutting back and you have these quick interplays in time. But that has been on the, with the sacrifice of, of traditional polyphony. No? So on one hand, my music has become one part. <laughs> There's no polyphony. On the other hand, there is a new polyphony, but which, which um, works in a different way, more like the, the pseudo polyphony in the Bach Partita, where yes. it's a polyphony that kind of occurs in your head um, uh, across time, rather than with things happening at the same time. Good. And during that uh, period of time, right, uh, there's a lot of, let's say, technological changes, right? Uh, say that again, please. During that period of time, right, in which you describe, right, there is a lot of huge technological change happened. Absolutely. And how this affected your music? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the change from analog to digital, which is completely destroying my work. <laughs> Tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> because you can't, you can't buy analog camera technology anymore. You can't, uh, you can't pluck your analog camera directly into the video projector anymore. And so everything gets a latency. And if there's something that for me is essential in live video, it's non, no perceivable level of latency. So, um, and I used to use these little small cameras, 30 years a piece. It started off being a necessity because that's all I could afford. But it turned out they also have a certain look and feel to them. And I started really liking that. And so that has, that has gone. Uh, and of course, I tried to buy big stocks and you can still get some stuff in China, but then you can't hook it up with the, with the projectors anymore, etc. Okay, so I'm not complaining. I'm just, I haven't found a, w a real way around this anymore. But except for that, maybe, of course, the, 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 the access to technology getting easier and easier and the surfaces of the softwares and even also of the hardwares getting easier and easier is simply just amplifying this feeling that you don't have to choose your little box, but you can actually uh, mix it all up as, as an auteur and, and still have your fingers in everything. Yeah, um, Which for me has become an point in order to connect. Yeah. I'm sure you can connect it even if you collaborate, video artist, composer, whatever, um, stage director. But for me, it has just worked. Uh, for me, it seems always seemed to be the direct way to make sure or to make give a better chance for integrating these different elements so that they don't become layers or, uh, but really become the one and the same inseparable uh, by 
by having it all come from the same brain. And in that, I am hugely dependent. There was a little bleep here, but by that I am uh, hugely dependent on this easy access to the media because I also can't use, I can't take a year out to learn a different software or to get experience in this or that area. So this um, is super important. And I think for everybody, you know, that now you really have this chance of if you have an idea and you can see it calls for this or that media or technology, you have the ability to already start experimenting with it and maybe even realizing it without a huge budget and a huge a team of collaborators. Um, um, yes. And so I think it has affected me. That being said, I had my last project. It's funny in that it's really about and using all the techniques and the aesthetics and the approach you might have and the associations you might have on a specific technology, which is video and film, but yes. there is no video and film. So everything is kind of translated into analog, which is a, which is a funny negation of all what I just said, but in a way also just saying everything needs, every idea has its perfect media. No? And since one of the ideas in this was actually kind of a translation of something native to one media into another one, with the whole, with the absurd challenges that that brings, uh, but also the um, the verfremdung, the there's a better word than alienation. The, the well, let's just say the alienation that occurs from from this translation or similar translations. And so, in a way, I have the feeling that this is a super low tech analog, and it's just stage mechanics and pulling pulling ropes and stuff. So that's very analog again, no, but. So analog. Well, I have a uh, fascination of, of uh, analog technology and mechanics. And of course it's also combinable. Uh, so it's not uh, excluding anything else, but I think that will always stay with me because that's where I started to play around, no? Um, yes, yes. So you, can you just, um, what could be your, your, let's say, three the most important technological artifacts, whether softwares or hardwares or devices, right, for you yeah. as composer? Mm. Well, I think the, the most important is, is the easy accessible uh, sound sequencer, right? that enables me okay. almost to sculpt. I wouldn't say in real time, but at least have a really big flexibility and a way to bring together samples, sounds, um, pre-programmed or live triggered with the click track that I'm using more and more uh, to coordinate everything. Uh, um, and even with video no? And so bringing all this together has just made life a lot easier or even made some projects realizable that wouldn't have been uh, realizable before. Uh, I think second of that, the easy access to, to, to video technology. No? So I think that has been important for my work cheap, very durable cameras that I can use and small in, in runtime era, to, I can treat them horribly. And even if one breaks, it's not a, you know, it's not a catastrophe. Uh, and then this, again, easy access or easy accessibility in, in, in software where I, can, where I can cut and finalize these videos because I'm just not the, um, I've never been the type who, yeah, who becomes the super expert in a particular software. No? I always only learned what I needed, 
which meant I could use different softwares just in that little area that I needed. And even if I needed something that I realized quickly I couldn't do without first really getting into it, I might actually hire somebody else to do it for me. Uh, and so for me, that's essential and has enabled me to keep a lot more focus on the creative part and less focus on the, uh, on, let's say, the, the boring side of craftsmanship. Um, because craftsmanship is not boring all the way through, but, you know, like uh, some, some parts of craftsmanship is definitely boring and could be something, could be a time used better on something creative. And um, what do you fear the most as composer? Actually, I think even it's your question, right? Huh? I think it's even your question. Once I asked you uh, several composers to, uh, to send me one question, which I can ask to other composers. Oh, okay. And I think this was yours, actually. No, why would I ask that? Mm, okay. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. You know, people change and I don't remember, you know, I don't look back. So maybe I have said that. I don't, I don't know what I meant with it. Um, and also, can't really come up with anything because yeah i i guess i try to be fearless and uh doesn't mean that i'm that i am but um on the other hand i have a certain weird i don't know where it comes from self-confidence <clears throat> that is of course sometimes necessary to yeah convince people to do something which takes a lot of time and money something big, ambitious, uh, in a way, it starts by me also believing that I can deliver my part of it and the, that the idea has uh, enough weight to use all these resources. And, and so that's a certain sort of uh, fearlessness. No? So um, I guess, yeah, but I, and I don't, I don't even really fear failing because I kind of accepted it as a as a possibility long time ago. I'm not sure I, I have really experienced this feeling of completely failing on a large scale, but I am open to it because I know only like that, if I really have this vision and I pursue it, maybe at one day it will not work out as I hope for or as I imagined. Uh, so what do I fear the most as a composer? Yeah, losing my hearing, maybe. I had, <laughs> I had last, this fall, no? I actually had like, um, like a hearing problem, came out of nowhere. Mm, and um, so I actually did a few shows with, I would say, 70% reduction of uh, my left ear. And yeah, the problem was that I couldn't trust my, my ears. And normally I really trust my ears. I, I, at some point I just let down technolo technological help and even to a certain degree opinions of other people yes. and also theoretical concerns. And I just really, try to trust my ears, no? Yes. Is it too loud? Is it too soft? Is this right? Is it wrong? Is yes. it too wrong? Yes. All this, no? And, um, um, and I had the feeling I couldn't really trust my ears, yeah? And that's, that was not nice. And then, but my, the end of this anecdote is something completely crazy, which is the hearing came back and it was maybe up to 70, now it's like 95%, so it's good again. No? But it came up to 80, so now I could hear by, on both ears. But I by then realized that everything was half a on higher one ear than on the other. It started by hearing a piano concerto, and I thought, that's really weird they play this piano concerto on this detuned or weirdly out of tune piano. Yes. And um, and so suddenly every piano concerto was, was my own piano concerto out of tune, so to speak. Uh, and I could take a sign tone and I could take it from here and it would go. 
uh, that's scary. And also kind of really puts into perspective the relativity of even sound that, you know, you, you know, of course, that the senses, or you know, of course, that, that a certain color for me might seem different for you, which is, which is not a big deal. It's just a part of um, perception. But for some reason, I think I have had come to believe that that pitch and sound also has a certain objectivity, you know? and but at least I, in this point, I can trust my ears because there's a physicality of how far it gets in before a certain yeah. uh, hair is activated to the, to the nerve. But no, also that was is completely relative, and so there's a good chance that we don't even hear the, the tones the same way, which is, I guess, obvious. Yes. yes. But I just never considered that before, and it kind of, um, uh, yeah, struck me quite hard. And now it, it the interval came, became smaller and smaller, and now it's now it's gone. Uh, but also struck me as uh, like the the ultimate um, punishment for a musician, like not even. To, to a certain degree worse than losing the hearing huh? that you can never hear harmony again it will always be a, a, a dissonance yes. I don't know what I want to hear <laughs> like, and so just to say I'm working kind of on a project where I'm going a little into translating some stuff from, from Dante's Inferno okay. to, uh, into a musical setting and without saying too much, that is one very obvious poetic punishment, no? like uh, to punish the people um, uh, cultivating the dissonance would be to put them in hell and uh, make them hear on different ears with a half tone of heart. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and next question, a very short one, is from Francois Chiran. Uh -huh. Uh, he has a question to everybody. He asked, uh, like I asked, asking it everybody, and uh, why you, wh why do you still compose, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I think it's fun, and I have the feeling that there's a lot of things I still haven't explored, and um, and uh, partly because it's fun, and uh, but maybe partly also because of other reasons I also think that is to a certain degree uh, meaningful and uh, and I like uh, I like sensoric experiences very focused and also in time and one of those elements or one of those situations or when a certain experience goes a certain way we categorize it as music and you didn't even say music you said composition because i think composing could be many other things sometimes i think i don't really know what i'm going to do in five years but that's actually more concerned with following wherever this takes me and maybe more concerned with the that i can't really tell how big a role sound and music would might uh play but um, so why do I still compose? Yeah, because I'm having fun and I think there's a lot of stuff that can still stimulate and challenge myself and um, whoever uh, might uh, wanna, wanna listen in. And uh, now it's maybe not about so much about your music, right? But uh, you as a as participant, right? In, in the new music scene, how do you, what are the biggest changes, right, in, in this century or in last uh, twenty-one year, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, obviously the biggest change is the um, um, is the internet, which is is changing music uh, in that it's actually giving us huge stage, or at least in some places even just a stage to to niche to to little very small hidden weird corners of of uh, yeah of everything and in our case of of music and art 
And so it's creating, uh, it's probably this creation and feeling of a global community. Um, uh, I think that's probably the biggest change. Then as always, there has been changes in aesthetics and focus, etc. But I think a lot of the things that we have reached now, if we look at the change from the last 20 years, is not so much a change that we haven't seen before. You know, the movement from maybe something more structural, abstract, focusing on sound and into something more multimedia, even if it meant something else in the 70s, but then also working with gestures and, and bodies and performance. I mean, that change uh, has happened before, no? It seems that every time it comes back, of course, it it's different because of the media, because of the because of the time. And so in a way, in that sense, it's more like a spiral. Uh, and, but specifically in the last 20 years, I think we had one of those changes where uh, 20 years ago, there was maybe more a focus on, on, on abstract um, sides of sound. And then slowly that has expanded to also, I don't think exclusively, I also don't even think in the majority, but at least um, a big part of, of music life has now expanded um, to a more um, concrete work with sound and, and a bigger connection and involvement or integration of everything surrounding music and sound. So where whereas sound and music can be this abstract parallel world, which makes complete sense and has a lot of meaning, but about itself mainly, right? And it kind of exists partly um, excluded from everything else. And then I think that has now expanded. So you still have that and that's perfect because why not? That's fine. But you now also have a big chunk opening up to the world and in doing that also expanding, in, expanding into other fields. Sometimes maybe even losing uh, or moving away from the place where it makes sense to call it music, but I think a nice, cha nice change, not just in music, but in arts in general is maybe also doesn't matter so much, no? Doesn't matter so much what we call it. Still, we have quite strict institutions. And, and so there's concert and music theater and there's theater, even though they're getting, they're really overlapping, no? And sometimes crossing. But I think maybe that's the next step. Uh, and yeah. And how audience change, right? Mm -hmm. but yeah, how did the audience change? Uh, well, uh, at least there's this, the, the internet audience and the community that has changed a lot by just connecting people um, and, and creating enough, creating a platform for even the smallest and weirdest of niches, no? um, but the audience, except for that, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I'm not sure. Has it grown? Maybe, but I think that's not the main thing. Uh, um, there are still people thinking, if you make a concrete sound, that's way too, anecdotal and just destroys the music the other people who who don't think that and um, um i think mm, 10 years ago when i started having a lot of concerts in germany i was surprised by this these uh, the, the immediate reaction which was 
uh, the fun is back in new music, you know? And I, I really didn't consider my music funny. I mean, I wouldn't use the word funny. Maybe there's humor in it, but it, it wasn't funny, you know? And then I thought that's because of the context. Of course, if in the context of a long conference on theoretical matters, you have a, the slightest informal attitude or hint at a joke, then of course that is funny. But that's more because of the context than because of, because of that moment. I thought maybe that was it. And I think maybe now it's not so such a surprise anymore and not so such a such an alien in the programs that it's um, that it creates so much attention. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that's a change in the audience or if it's just the actually more the change in 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 the musical focus. Yes. So maybe that's also not a good uh, answer. And how do you feel? Uh, because we talk about last 25 years, but uh, where what's the biggest trend where music uh, right new music is getting out, or there are or no, or maybe there's. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I think the interesting thing about the music is that there's so many directions at the same time. Right? But even, and so even if 25 years ago, I already had the feeling that this is not a genre because you can't really find one common denominator to describe this. And I think that factor has just grown. No, so that now you have even more things and they're even stronger and pursuing their own thing. And I think maybe a big change is this, the, that we're arguing a little bit less who's right. <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about certain, certain, uh, yeah, a certain approach where is not such as it's not just about the one plus the other it's like we have to find out which one is the right one maybe it's a little bit of german thing i think i hear less of that uh now and i think that's wonderful that you can have these different things coexist on the scene yes but also in in the mind of the listener no? so more so many more composers are I don't know if they're just admitting it or finding interest now in in popular music or other art forms, yeah. And I think um, that's that's something that was there 25 years ago, but it has grown and has become much more explicit and um, and also much more like um, uh, yeah, like a thing, you don't have to choose. It can really be things yes. existing next to each other uh, in this big, uh, and it doesn't have to be that you're just on one line. No, it's yes. just yes. Yes. Uh, many different trends. So that would, that's a meta trend, but I think in that sense of the word, that might be a trend. Yes. And um, last question, right, uh, is about what is your perspective? What is a um, mu new music role in society, right? Uh, please say it again. Mm, what is a uh, new music role in society? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, uh, yeah, again, I would say we could, we could start in that question at different positions because we could first define what is new music and we could also define what is music but, uh, and what is new. And, but, um, uh, if we kind of just jump into it and say, assume that we know that, then, uh, and, I, and I answer a little bit more generally, I would say one of the roles uh, art can have is to kind of be on the outside. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of talk about being relevant for the system in the context of corona and i think yeah one of the interesting perspectives on that is actually well you can also be relevant to a system by 
by being outside the system. No? And in, in our case, I guess this, the system is a little bit also the, the mainstream uh, cultural music area. And, uh, and I think it's an important role to be on the outside, reflect on it, be creative about it in different ways. Uh, turn it upside down, have fun with it, uh, deconstruct it. Yeah, but um, um, and I think that's an important role. But I think it's also a natural phenomenon, human phenomenon, that this exists. That there is a certain way of doing things, and then there will always be people who kind of. Uh, see new combinations and then art and music has become one way of doing that uh, exploring that and even if it doesn't have a concrete impact then I think just the fact that that people are dealing with it and audiences are experiencing it I think it does flow back into uh, yeah people's perspectives and experiences uh, in, in other parts of life as well. And um, yeah, it just, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, going further than that, I, I have other things to say, but I think it'll be too long and too heavy. Yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Simon. Yeah.